straight paths, valleys filled, mountains and hills made low, the crooked straightened out, the rough places made smooth. All of us see as far as we need to see. In my imagination, this passage conjures up lots of earth moving equipment, lots of time and toil, lots of engineering and planning ahead. In fact, to me it sounds like the great public works project that took place in East Tennessee between 1955 and 1974, building I-75 north and south and I-40 east and west. It was happening all over the country, of course, this straightening and flattening and smoothing of public roads. You might not remember those days, but I do. In 1956, when my family drove from Tallapoosa, Georgia to Seattle, Washington, there was no interstate. The way west was Route 66, basically two lanes. The way north, along the Pacific coast, was Highway 1, two lanes. Fast forward quite a few years, and by the time I rode with my parents to Carson Newman to see the campus before I applied, in about 1967, I think, we drove on two-lane highway straight through the heart of downtown Knoxville. Red light after red light after red light. The interstate had begun, but it was only fits and pieces, fits and starts. And then during college, which was for me was 68 to 72, only a few pieces of I-75 were available for my trips home. We were grateful that 75 took us into Chattanooga without winding up and down all those mountains. But the stretch of I-75 from Cleveland to Lenore City didn't exist. And I-40 East ended at Asheville Highway, just outside of the President Eisenhower first championed interstate network because he had served in World War II, of course, and he realized that we had no broad, flat highways on which our citizens could flee if we were ever attacked or under a threat of nuclear attack. And most of those days were transported by railways and road traffic, which of course had their limitations. And our nation in this post-war period needed to create jobs and to build a big post-war economy. And so building a great highway system was one way to take care of all that. In other words, if our country wanted to do big things, we needed to open up and smooth out the connections among places and people and goods. And we needed to stop killing each other on the roads. In the late 50s and early 60s, highway fatalities hit close to home for me. My dad lost a medical friend to an accident when he was on his way to take his board exams for internal medicine. Killed the baby, too. In my tiny high school, it seemed that almost every year one student would die in a car wreck. One was a friend of my older brother's, one was a friend of mine, one was a friend of my younger brother's. Clearly, something needed to change, and the statistics proved it. For example, in 1956, when my family had been making that long drive um, from Georgia to Washington, there were 37,965 people killed in motorcycle accidents, excuse me, motor accidents. And that's about 22.8 people killed on our highways per 100,000 population. By 2018, the last year I could get the numbers, we had, with thanks to better roads and three-point seat belts, airbags, and stricter laws against drunk driving, our motor deaths dropped to 11.18 per 100,000 population, less than half of the 1956 figure. Straighten things out, lift them up, smooth them, widen them, open up what's too narrow, even out anything that's jagged, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. So says Isaiah, and we still need the prophet's message. 
How we live together needs not only to look different, it needs to function differently. We need to let God and all of God's people in. We need to take down any barriers to God's healing, because we all need it. We need it everywhere, we need it all the time, and God is willing. So why are we still so snarled up like 1950s traffic on a two-lane highway during the holidays? We're snarled up in our politics, in our families, sometimes even in our churches. We're snarled up like malfunction junction used to be. Remember that, especially during the World's Fair? That place where 75 and 40 poured their traffic into each other, and you could sit there for a long time. Why is it that God's promise to invade our lives and build them back better, to invade our lives with peace and generosity, seems like the last thing we really want? Why do we resist it, though? Why do we not want God's peace, God's righteousness, God's healing? When God time and time again has offered to rescue us, from our craziness. Well, if we look at the witness of Scripture and the witness of my own heart, I think it's the repentance part. That's where our instinct for self-preservation kind of kicks in. We might think we want change, but we don't want it to go very deep, and we know it's going to cost us something if we allow it to happen. It will cost us an admission that while we may look holy, and we may even wish we were holy, we're not. God's forgiveness will cost us the truth, accepting that we are less than we could be, because that's what we've chosen. Often our response is just to put on our good-looking suits, trot out our best manners, say nothing, don't change anything, and pretend those angels and prophets who are swarming around us must be coming to somebody else because I'm just fine, thank you. We are willing to give God a few blue or purple Sundays, but we hope that after Christmas, all the hoopla about repentance is going to be over. Jesus will be here, so we will need to repent, right? We hope that if we can ignore God's crew, the angels and the prophets, they will soon march through town and keep on going. So we can just go home as usual, lock up our doors, have a nice cup of tea, and not be bothered about this righteousness question anymore. God wants to forgive us. The door is open from God's side. God wants to welcome us into a different sort of life, where all the circumstances that now are stealing our lives away, the same way bad roads can steal our lives away at high speed, all that will be fixed. God wants to heal all the dangerous, dysfunctional topography of our souls. But we treat this very best news ever as if God were an invading enemy, somebody from whom we must flee or hide. Why? Why is that? I do think it's that part about repentance. Change, admitting that we need it. Changing direction. Redesigning our interchanges with other people so that the space between you and me, between them and us, flows without panic or harm. To be faithful, I think, we've got to stop honking our positions like horns against other cars. We've got to stop riding the other guy's bumper as if we were only our wants really matter. To stop cutting in and out of other people's lives just to see who has the most nerve and who can push his way forward. See, the thing is, we forget about grace. Repentance comes with grace. And when we are willing to name the deadly curves that we have been taking and the cliffs we have pressed each other up against, grace says, yeah, I know you felt it. Sometimes you even forget other people are on the road, and that habit will kill you, Grace says. But you don't have to stay on the road. I've given you plenty of off-ramps. Just turn around 
Go back in the other direction. That's what God is offering. And it's true that sometimes we do want God to come, like a traffic cop or a highway engineer, and make our lives work better. Sometimes we get in a jam and finally pray, please, just fix this. But mostly we're afraid to pull over. We're so wrapped up with getting somewhere first or fastest and without a traffic ticket, keeping our paint job being free, that we don't take an opportunity to stop at the wellness and figure out where we really are, whether this route is taking us where we really want to go. We often don't want to stop and ask directions the way Advent offers them to us because we're afraid of what we'll find out. We may have to turn and go in the other direction. And we're afraid we may not endure the remedy. We can't bear admitting how badly we have been driving. We don't want anybody else to know about it. We don't want anybody else to see us sitting on the side of the road with the car door open and turning the map this way and that in our laps and realizing that we're also almost out of gas. I've been there. You've probably been there too. We need exits off our dead-end roads. And so does everybody else. We need a way to get out of the dangers we're causing ourselves and other people. And God has sent a construction crew, angels and prophets, to show us a safer way. We need to give up our breakneck speed toward the cliff, and so does everyone else. And we need to be forgiven, and so does everyone else, so we can all start over. Because for forgiveness is the rule of the road, we can all make it home safely, gracefully. God is rolling into town, coming to refine us the way fire refines silver, the way strong soap gets stains out of our clothes, the way roadblocks send us in a new direction. That's what repentance is about, being changed. Being willing to call up God's triple A, if you will, and admitting that we have landed in the wrong place, that our brakes have burned out, our tires have gone flat, and somebody stole our keys when we stopped to use the restroom. When we make that call, God comes. God comes and gets us started and sends us back to a road surrounded by life and love with room for all who want to go that way where nobody's in enough of a hurry to run over everybody else. Yes, God is rolling toward us. And in today's election, the blue lights are flashing. And God will give us the answer as many times and as many times as we make those rescue calls. God is not rolling toward us like a conquering army with weapons of mass destruction just to ruin our lives. God is moving toward us to unsnarl everything, to unsnarl the traffic of our lives, to transform us, to help us let go of whatever is causing danger. God is coming to make us a family who live by grace and can marvel at it all along the way. God is coming to welcome us into God's kingdom where we have a part to play. We are to be about straightening things out, making room for everyone, lifting up what is too low, smoothing out what is too rough and harsh, widening our world. We are to open up what's too narrow, to even out peaks and valleys in our society. That's how all flesh, Isaiah says, all flesh, shall see the salvation of God. That's the way home. So follow the signs. Look at your map. Turn around now. The life we lose to grace is the one that saves us. 